everyone. I'm Mina Harris and I am here with my friend, actually my best friend in the whole world. Claire Woods. And this is just so special. We've never done an event together. Um, we talk all the time, obviously, but to get to do this um, for this occasion is so special and I'm, I'm so excited. So I'm honored. I'm more than honored to be participating in conversations with change makers hosted by The Little Market. The Little Market is a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering women. And this conversation is a part of a series that was created to bring awareness to issues that impact women globally. I'd like to introduce Claire. She is an attorney at the NRDC and she uses the law to prevent pollution and to support communities in their struggle to protect their health from the negative impact of pollution. Welcome, Claire. Thank you, Mina. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, I'm Claire Woods, and I'm honored to serve on the Little, Little Markets Council. I'd like to give them a huge shout out because this year they reached a significant milestone by providing a million hours of dignified work to artisans all over the world. All right, so before we start, I'd like to provide some data to contextualize our conversation. 2.2 billion people do not have access to clean water. 4.2 billion people, more than half of the world's population, do not have access to safe sanitation services. 297,000 children below the age of five die from diseases related to poor sanitation and hygiene and unsafe drinking water. And finally, 80% of wastewater flows back into the ecosystem without being treated or reused. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, I, I, I'm not, in, I think we have sort of a general audience for this. And so I actually want to step all the way back. I know we're going to get into the data and more of the issues, but one thing that just makes me so proud of you and um, to just watch your journey as a, an environmental justice lawyer um, relates to representation in, in the field. And um, during the presidential election, I had the chance to um, have a number of conversations with other women of color leaders in the environmental justice field. And one of the things that we talked about, including Ayanna Johnson, who I know you're a fan of, and obviously I am too. Total fan. Like she's just so brilliant and amazing. But, you know, like you, um, one of few Black women, right, who are in this space. And one of the things we talked about is that, you know, uh, historically, the way I thought about environmental justice issues was sort of like, oh, that's like a white guy thing, right? Or that doesn't affect me. Or I, I just didn't have sort of examples of, of people who were, you know, advocating in that space. And part of that is because um, like all spaces, right? There have been um, issues with access and now we're in a different era and there are so many uh, communities finally represented, right? And the point is that when you're represented, your experiences are represented. And, and now we're really, I think, having um, crucial conversations around environmental justice and the way that that relates to racial justice, right? And the impact of the environment on black and brown communities, which were often left out of those conversations when we didn't have people like you and, and Ayanna Johnson at the table. So I just wanna start there because I think it's important to recognize and celebrate and also talk about how much more you know progress we need to make in terms of representation. But can you just talk about the shifts that you've seen and how having black women like you and like Ayanna Johnson um, in, in, involved in this work and having access to you know advocacy changes what that looks like in terms of communities being represented and their experiences being addressed? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been doing this work for 10 years. My first six years were um, for the US Department of Justice and Environmental Enforcement Section, working to enforce our nation's environmental laws, the laws that we all depend on to help protect our health and our communities. Um, and, and then the, the following four years with Natural Resources Defense Council doing really similar work from a nonprofit perspective. And throughout all of that time, I am almost always the only black woman or person of color in the room. Um, when I'm standing up in court, I'm almost always the only person of color um, in, in the entire room, aside from my clients. And my clients are often 
um, people of color, they come from communities of color because communities of color suffer the most as a result of the environmental problems this country faces. Um, and so I see this issue all the time. I do think that there has been a lot of progress made even in just the last year. Um, organizations like NRDC are paying attention to um, make it, creating a more inclusive environment for people of color, staff of color, our partners and um, communities that we work in and with. But there's a long way to go. There's so much work that needs to be done to um, incorporate the voices of people of color into this into this movement and um, make sure the 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 people who are most affected by environmental burdens and environmental harms are a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. um, the environmental movement was started, the modern day environmental movement was started by white men um, in the 1970s, 60s and 70s. Those men are still at these organizations and still making decisions, still in leadership roles, still have control over budgets. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of change that needs to happen. Um, but I think we're on the right track. I was, um, I've been very heartened by a lot of the changes that um, have been made at organizations like NRDC and the Department of Justice over the last three years. Yeah, and I, you know, that's, it's an important point that we still have a long way to go. Um, and I appreciate, and I think it's important also to note that, as you said, you've been doing this work for <laughs> 10 years. And I mean, it's one of the things that I admire so much about you that I feel like in college, you like knew that this was what you wanted to do and the issue that you deeply cared about. And in fact, I think, I mean, for me, as someone who wasn't sort of as engaged with um, environmental issues, I feel like my first sort of exposure to it was when we were at Stanford and, you know, both of us were doing work in East Palo Alto, right? And we know that there are tons of environmental justice issues there. And the point is, again, when you experience it, right, you have an understanding of um, the sort of broad impact of these issues across communities. But when those communities are that have those distinct experiences are left out of decision making rooms are left out of policy making, then their unique issues are not addressed, right? And it takes, you know, having folks like you and others who are actually impacted and can um, understand that right to advocate. But so can you, I, I, I think it's still important to just sort of high level explain what the intersection is between racial justice and environmental justice and the fact that I think we all know and that is becoming more part of this, you know, dialogue, which is that environmental justice is racial justice. Can you just it, outline that? Yeah, it absolutely is. I see it in my work every day. We're not, we don't have facilities, industrial polluting facilities, spewing um, NOx, PM, particulate matter, other, uh, other emissions that are these devastating emissions that really tear apart communities. We don't have those facilities in upper class white neighborhoods or rich white neighborhoods. So we have those types of facilities in black and brown communities. Um, and it is like that because our leaders have often allowed um, companies to, to site facilities there because they don't believe that the communities have the political power to fight for themselves. And that's what being, you know, being why I do the work that I do, um, because I wanna make sure that those communities, that in black and brown communities um, have the opportunity and have the resources they need, the legal representation they need to say, no, not in my backyard, not in my, not in my community. You're not putting another, you know, metal shredder. You're not adding another terminal to a huge bustling port that brings in all sorts of emissions right into my kid's school. Mm -hmm. Um, th these, the intersection between, you know, environmental problems and racial justice, it's just, they line, it lines up completely. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the health problems that our communities face, asthma, I mean, I remember in college, you had asthma, it was terrible. And so many of our- I was just gonna, I was just gonna mention that. I mean, and I, yeah, I wanna dig into that, which is that it's environmental justice, racial justice, health justice, and it's compounded over years and generations, right? And yeah, I had bad asthma. I have bad asthma. And I, I, I'm i going to get this probably wrong, but I believe historically 
people uh, who lived in East Palo Alto suffered from asthma, uh, kids in East Palo Alto suffered from asthma at greater rates because that was a, I don't remember exactly what the environmental justice issue was. I think it was a, there was a dumping site. I know that there were issues with, you know, blighted land there. Um, and, you know, now I'm in San Francisco and, and the Bayview is another example of this, right? When you talk about ports and all the, the, the health issues that this leads to, the most obvious way that I think people have engaged with this issue, you know, who may not be impacted or outside of these communities is with obviously lead and water, right? And I know we're going to get into that. But yeah, can you just talk generally about sort of beyond the, that extreme example of, you know, lead and water, uh, you know, asthma, right? Cancer and these other issues that are compounded over many, many generations? Certainly, I mean, I can give you one example, which is the Port of Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach. It's a huge facility in the community that, um, it's a huge facility that uh, really supplies all of the goods that we all rely on. Um, our cars, our TVs, everything that all of us use every day much of it comes in through the port of Los Angeles and the port of Long Beach. And guess what? That's not free. In order to make that happen, they spew pollution into the air. And guess what? The community that is right next to the port of LA and the port of Long Beach is largely black and brown. And guess what else? That region of California has some of the most contaminated air in California, largely due to the port's operations, and the highest rates of asthma and the highest cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the, that pollution is going straight into these communities. Um, there are schools there. There are, you know, families that are living within just within hundreds of feet of port facilities. It's, it's, it's devastating. And these communities, you know, are tired as they should be of um, being a dumping ground for, um, industry and and paying paying the cost of that with their lives and with their health mm -hmm. and obviously i mean in your work you're using the law right to advance justice for these communities that have been impacted by uh pollution and damage to the environment what is what is the solution i know that's a it's a layered issue and it's complex but on the one hand i'm imagining obviously we need to stop you know, corporations and, you know, these other powerful interests from building there and, and, and you know, having business activities that are, um, you know, polluting in these uh, communities. And my follow-up question on that was like, well, where do they go? Are we just stopping their activities altogether? Are we finding that, like, what is the, you know, policy uh, legal response? But then I imagine the other part is also that it's about um, helping to build political power in these communities so that they can, fight back. So I guess it's two, it's, you know, two prong question. Uh, what can we do with, you know, what are, what, how can we help to empower, you know, and, and give political power to these or build political power in these communities? And then also what tools do they have in terms of advocacy through the law to fight back? And, and what are we demanding of, you know, these cor corporations that are polluting? I mean, these are huge questions. These are, this is a <laughs> I know, like the whole question. Of, I did not, yeah. It probably has like 10 parts or but like if you can't you know that's the thing I, to me I think about environmental issues I feel like on the one hand we talked about how I just didn't see myself sort of represented in, in advocates right it felt kind of like a white guy thing and I didn't feel I knew about the effects with my asthma like I had a personal connection to it but part of it is that it does feel like a very complex issue and I think for ordinary people to feel like they can understand it or engage with it it can be like overwhelming or sort of hard to understand so can you kind of break it down as best as you can for a lay audience? Yeah, I mean, I would say one thing I would say is that we have our bedrock traditional environmental laws. Um, we have the Clean Air Act, we have the Clean Water Act, we have the Safe Drinking Water Act, and all of the other federal protections that Congress put in place for us in the 70s and 80s. Um, but the usefulness of those tools ha ha um, uh, has a limit. They're, they we use those laws to um, protect communities to the best that we can. But um, if we really wanna start creating change, if we really want to start, get ourselves on track for uh, the type of clean energy economy that President Biden is talking about, we need to do more than work under those laws. There's a ton of changes that need to happen at the policy level. For example, 
reducing pollution is not free. It requires investment. Um, businesses will do will do what you know what we want will reduce pollution if they are you know forced to spend money to do it um they won't do it voluntarily but they will do it if they're forced if they're um if we put policies in place that require for example clean energy technologies or penalize um pollution uh in a way that's not currently penalized on our under our traditional environmental laws so i think that's that's one place to start when people are thinking about like what are the next steps to um, creating, you know, a more progressive environment, creating more progressive environmentalism in America. Um, it's really, I think, better policies at the federal and state level to incentivize businesses to make responsible for the environment, for families, for community. Can you talk quickly about just those different layers of regulation? You're talking about forcing businesses to comply with uh, laws, right? Uh, environmental laws and some of that. You mentioned a lot of federal laws. What, how much can be done at the federal level? How much is this really a, a state and local uh, issue in terms of where you can have the greatest impact to make change? It's both. We need federal, we need um, litigation, advocacy, policy, um, and, you know, new laws at the federal level. We absolutely need that um, to have consistency across the country to make unified change. But mm -hmm. we also need our, our state and local governments to step up and enact policies that work on the local level to make sure that things aren't falling through the cracks and that, um, businesses, local governments are incentivized to make good decisions for mm -hmm. the, the people who live around them and in them. What can, you know, I, I think we have a um, big LA audience uh, with this event and I'm curious, I mean, you mentioned Long Beach and, and LA, you know, what can ordinary people do? Um, I think, again, I think from the outside, people see someone like yourself, who's like, you're a lawyer, you're in it, you're litigating, right? Like you're representing these interests, but what about ordinary folks that, you know, and I want to get away from sort of the it, things that we as individuals can do, right? To be better in terms of our day-to-day -day practices with the environment, but I'm talking about advocacy for black and brown communities to address environmental and racial justice issues. What is the best way for people to get engaged? Is it to donate? to organizations is it is you know is there advocacy work that they can be engaging in at the at the local and state level that that is meaningful and impactful i mean there's so much that people can do a lot of it is on the individual level make better choices about the products you buy and the companies that you support i mean i i, I have to catch myself all the time um shopping at places or you know even buying food that i know is not grown in a sustainable way and you know make the choice to shop at a place like the little market where um they rely on artisans they source their products from artisans um in a sustainable way um so that is that is the personal uh uh a personal action that you can take but as far as bigger picture um look google environmental justice organizations in my area there are hundreds of community organizers and environmental justice organizations across the country that are fighting like hell to create change for their communities. Um, and they need our support. Um, there are tons in the LA area. Um, East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice is just one. Um, and you can look them up, see how you can get involved in their events, see how you can support them, donate to them. Um, they do incredible work for communities. And I think that's definitely one way to make a big change. Donating to our big national environmental organizations like NRDC is great too. They're supporting the work that I do. And um, my colleagues and I always appreciate our members. We love having support from donors and members, but to be honest, it's really the, the local groups, um, the local change, change makers that make such a huge difference for communities. And they are the ones that need the support the most. Mm -hmm. What is the like number one or top whatever two or three issues in LA? Uh, it just made you made me realize. I mean, that's like the thing that everybody knows about LA, especially if you're from Northern California and you're flying in, and it's the sky, the pollution. And there's a big thing around the pandemic that because there's been so, less 
you know, business activity because of um, COVID, that the, the air quality was visibly clearer and better. What, I mean, is that sort of like the biggest issue in LA? Is it air quality? What would you say are the top uh, priorities around environmental justice where you are? Air quality is a huge uh, problem. And I, and for the Los Angeles, area. I, it, all, it has been for decades. It continues to be. And I think sometimes we need to be careful about um, equating some pause in business activity with uh, due to COVID-19 with actual real pollution reduction. Right, pollution right. is still out there. If you go out to the um, communities that I was talking about earlier, Wilmington, um, San Pedro, right along by the port, um, by the port of LA and the port of Long Beach, you see huge container ships just lined up right now, dozens of them waiting to get into the port, waiting to get into unload, go unload goods. And those, the emissions that are coming from there just go straight into the basin, into mm -hmm. the air basin here in Los Angeles. And the mountains in our, in our um, area kind of hold that pollution in. And that's one of the reasons why Los Angeles has such terrible air quality. So I think you know, air quality, the air quality in Los Angeles is one of the biggest issues that our community faces. Mm -hmm. um, stormwater runoff is a big issue. Also, there's, there's a number of issues. Um, and uh, it's, it's almost impossible to kind of address all of them. But I, I guess I would say, I think air, air, air pollution is the, the biggest one that comes to mind for me. Mm -hmm. At least I do work on that issue. Right. Well, you also do a lot of work around clean water. So I want to talk about that. And I think that has gotten a lot more national attention, um, again, in large part due to the work of activists, Black activists who are on the ground advocating, um, such as um, Marie, Marie Copney, Little Miss Flint. Um, in Flint I'm a Michigan. fan. She's so, I mean, she's just um, brilliant. And, um, you know, it's just a, a wonderful example of she and she's young. I don't. I, I'm like she started this when she's gotta she was be like thirteen or fourteen. Exactly. Or something. I think she's still a teenager, and you know she decided that she was gonna do something and that she wanted to do something for her community and and just did it. You know, and I think it's such a great example for all of us who are looking for ways, you know, to in, engage and and to uh, make an impact in our own ways in our own communities. Um, but I, and I know you've done work around that also in New Jersey, right? I mean, these issues um, exist everywhere, but can you first, I mean, we've been talking about legislation. Can you just briefly talk about the, the clean water rule and you know what, how that can help and then um, wanna talk about some of the casework that you've done in New Jersey? The Obama administration came out with the clean water rule and industry challenged it some as not, um, too, too protective and some environmental groups also challenged it as not protective enough. Um, when the Trump administration came in, uh, they actually undid that, that rule, the clean water rule, and um, promulgated what we like to call the dirty water rule, which is truly an accurate name. Um, the, the dirty water rule rolls back protections for streams, water bodies, wetlands that we all rely on for clean water in this country. Um, and it's really devastating for, for all of us that, um, that the Trump administration took that action in, in putting forth the dirty water rule. And I'm, I'm really hoping that there's been ongoing litigation about the dirty water rule. And I know that so many of us are hoping that the Biden administration will take action to address it. I know that the dirty water rule doesn't affect lead in water, but that is also another big issue. And we, we talked about that with Flint in New Jersey. I, I wanna go back to just the health effects of this, right? Because these are, these are uh, issues that affect our bodies and our health that we may not even be aware of. And what is the effect of lead in, in drinking water? What does that mean for our bodies? Lead is just devastating to the human body, especially for young children whose brains are still developing. Um, it causes all sorts of challenges for, for babies and kids, um, developmental delays, learning difficulties, all sorts of um, real challenges that can limit people in their lives. And the tragedy of it is that um, many communities that have experienced or are experiencing lead in drinking water are, are in that situation because of poor infrastructure. 
and because the investments that need to be made in infrastructure have not been required by our federal government and our local governments just haven't stepped up to um, make those types of investments. Um, and so, are disproportionately black and brown communities. Absolutely. Right? So I think a lot of people know about um, the Flint drinking water crisis and um, know some of the history there, but Flint is not the only place that has led has had a problem with lead in drinking water. There are um, cities across the country that have lead levels of lead that are far too high for to be health protective. Um, uh, the federal standard for lead in drinking water right now is 15 parts per billion, but experts agree um, that 15 parts per billion is not a health protective level and that there's no safe level of lead for kids. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you have, you know, uh, uh, tap water with four parts per billion of lead in it, it's it can be devastating to your child's brain development. Mm -hmm. It's a really um, uh, uh, horrific problem for this country. And I know that the Biden administration is working on um, coming up with a revised lead and copper rule, which is the rule that some of the litigation that you might've heard about in Flint or in Newark is, is based on. Um, and I, I'm hopeful that the new lead and copper rule will actually set some health-based, health protective standards for communities. Because you're right, it is black and brown communities that are, are largely and disproportionately affected by lead and drinking water. Mm -hmm. And it just underscores the point, right, of how this is just layered racism and discrimination in that it's not only affecting your health, it's for children, it's affecting your ability to learn and your developmental abilities, right? I mean, it's just at every single level, it is creating, um, it is creating harm. And uh, it just speaks to not only, you know, the urgency of solving these issues, but how deep they are, right? And um, how deep the harm is that um, comes from, from it. Um, you were lead counsel in a big case. We've been talking about Newark and you were lead in, in New Jersey and you were lead counsel in a big case in Newark about lead pollution. Can you talk about that? And it sounds like, I mean, from what you're saying that lead pollution is a problem in the US across the country and that it is obviously can have worse issues in different places, but would love to talk about Newark in the context of the, the whole country. Sure. Um, Newark had extraordinarily high levels of lead in the city's tap water. Um, lead in drinking water, it is, it is fairly common across the country, but um, it happens when um, lo local water systems aren't adequately treating the water. And it also mainly happens in older cities um, that have older uh, lead-based infrastructure. So you need you you really need two things. You need an older city that has older lead pipes, um, lead service lines that connect the main line um, to the the lead service line connects the main line running through the middle of the street to the home. Mm -hmm. For older cities that have lead that where lead service lines are common, if the city or the water system is not adequately treating with the water with um, this uh, chemical called corrosion control treatment. Um, then when the water runs through those lead service lines, it'll corrode the lead, the old lead pipes and cause the lead to deposit into the water, flake off from the pipes, deposit into the water and come out of the resident's tap. Um, so that's what was happening in, in Newark. They didn't have a corrosion control treatment system in place and they had old lead pipes. And as a result, they had you know, astronomical levels of lead far exceeding the federal action level um, by magnitude. Mm -hmm. um, and their communities were affected. Um, we, our clients were an uh, uh, organization of, um, of, our clients were an organization of uh, public school teachers who had had enough and were seeing the effects of lead poisoning in their students mm -hmm. um, and also amongst their families. And they decided to take action, and we represented them in litigation for several, several, several years to secure safe drinking water for residents. Um, and there's still a long way to go, but there have been a lot of improvements in, in Newark. And um, I'm hopeful that the lead and copper rule at the federal level will come out and under the Biden administration and will really put in place some 
better standards for communities to keep them safer from lead. Mm -hmm. If 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 Newark had um, if all communities had um, well, if the lead and copper rule had um, the current lead and copper rule had more protective standards right now, many of these communities wouldn't be in the place that they are in right now. So we really need change at the federal level to make sure that there are protections in place for, for communities to make sure that um, lead isn't seeping into our water. Mm -hmm. Well, something I feel like I've learned, which is an obvious thing, but just making the connection here, which is, you know, we've been having a lot of conversation around the activities of corporations, right, and the need through the law and regulations to, you know, um, regulate that and, and stop that in some cases. But you're also speaking to infrastructure, which, again, is maybe an issue that people are not thinking about on a daily basis, but we are seeing the effects of when you neglect that in Texas right now, right, what happens when you don't have um, infrastructure. And um, we know coming out of, you know, the Trump administration that there was this infrastructure week that was supposed to happen and never, right? Like when you let these things go um, and, you know, are not prioritizing them, they, uh, you know, have deep, deep, real impacts on uh, communities um, across the board. Um, so I think it's an important, you know, connection to make. And it's unfortunate that I think it takes crisis and catastrophe on the level of what happened in Texas for people to see it and understand it. And it shouldn't take that. Uh, and, and it speaks to the, you know, to your point, we need leadership, right? We need folks who are in charge stepping up and just doing the right thing. Um, and it's just, it's, a, it's almost a, you know, really disappointing, frustrating conversation to even have, because what we're talking about is just such basic quality of life issues, like clean drinking water. So I will say that yet it doesn't happen. And there right. are families and communities that are struggling across the country with all, uh, a whole array of environmental challenges. Right. Um, so, you know, we need to step up and start really centering our policies around addressing these problems. Mm -hmm. So water poverty, we've talked a lot about black and brown communities and how this is a, you know, environmental justice is, is racial justice. Um, water poverty also has a disproportionate impact on women. Can you talk about that and, and describe how that manifests? So it is their responsibility to find water for cooking, for hygiene, for sanitation. And, you know, when there's where when there's pollution in the water or water scarcity, that has a disproportionate impact on women who are responsible for providing for their families. Um, I, I don't personally do international work, but every once in a while my work intersects with international issues. And I see this all the time that, you know, women are 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 tasked with providing water for their families, for their water, for their families to survive. And yet in many places, it is not that easy to mm -hmm. just, you know, provide that water. Mm -hmm. What, so I hate like having this conversation, my first thought is, you know, I need to stop drinking tap water. And I, you know, California, I think has some of the cleanest tap water, um, I think, is that correct? Or at least in San, in San Francisco? Maybe. Well, what I would suggest, I, I suggest everyone to get your water tested. Getting your water get tested. Again. Oh, get I your water would, tested. Get your water tested. It's it's not difficult to do. There are programs. Um, there are affordable programs. Um, pay what you can programs that do things like lead and water testing. Um, you can also get a more comprehensive test. Um, you can order them from places like My Tap Four at Berkeley, uh, mm -hmm. UC California Berkeley, and um, they will. Help you understand what's in your water. Um, doing a test will help you understand what type of filter you might want to use um, because bottled water, you would be surprised, um, is not regulated as much as we think it is. Mm -hmm. um, the limit for lead in bottled water is five parts per billion, last time I checked. So you could be drinking a bottle of water that still has lead levels that experts say are not health protective and are far too high. Um, so I, I don't think issues of single use plastic with that, right? Exactly. Well, so uh, are you saying that um, at home filters can be more effective in uh, preventing um, lead in your water than bottled water? Um, I don't know if I would take, I, I think there's a lot of factors to take into account there, um, but I will say that at home filters, if you have the right kind of filter and ensure that it's certified um, to reduce lead, at-home filters can be really effective in removing lead from water. Um, 
and and tests can also help you help you collect information about your home and and what's mm -hmm. going on in the pipe. So I want to shift. I know we're gonna um, end the conversation soon, and I uh, we talked a lot about water and air pollution, and um, it would be crazy not to talk about climate change, um, which is another pressing, you know, urgent uh, environmental issue. And I'll ask the question in the um, context of again, just people being able to understand sort of legislation or other, you know, things that they may have seen on the news and not quite, you know, understand what they mean, which is the Paris Agreement, right? And the Paris Agreement has been in the news a lot over the last four years. Can you uh, tell our audience what it is and how important it is that the United States has now rejoined the Paris Agreement? It is so heartening to me that the U.S. rejoined the Paris Agreement. Um, it, as an environmentalist um, and a supportive environmental justice and um, someone who cares about these issues, it was so demoralizing and devastating when the Trump administration pulled us out. The Paris Agreement is part of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and that is a, an annual meeting where leaders around the world come together and figure out how we're gonna solve the climate crisis. It's been going on for years. Um, uh, but they haven't really been able to make a lot of progress until the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is a commitment by all of the major industrialized nations to reduce climate change causing emissions. That's huge. We've never had a commitment um, like that before. And the fact that we rejoined it is, is really um, uh, monumental for, for us, for the world. It's very exciting. Thank you. I mean, this has been incredibly informative for me and I hope for everyone watching. I do want to end on a positive note. <laughs> um, I'll emphasize that we have like devastating, urgent, you know, uh, environmental crises that we all, I believe, need to be a part of. And we've talked in this conversation about ways for individual people to get involved and to be mindful of this stuff. But I want to end on a positive note, which is what gives you hope? We just talked about rejoining the Paris Agreement. I think that's one thing. What else makes you hopeful despite all of the you know, hard issues we, we still have to tackle? A lot of things give me hope. Working with clients who feel like we're making real improvements in their life, um, it gives me so much hope. Um, seeing winning cases gives me hope. I love it when we are able to secure outcomes for communities and for our clients. Um, but I think just bigger picture than either of those things. Um, one thing that really gives me hope is that people are talking about this issue. Um, when I was in law school studying this, studying environmental law and wanting to be where I am today, I, was, I thought it was such an important issue. And I thought, why doesn't anyone else care about this? Why, isn't, why aren't people talking about the fact that our planet is, 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 suffering and that and when our planet suffers communities suffer and people suffer um and i i i was always so um frustrated that it wasn't a bigger issue that our leaders didn't embrace addressing climate change and that nobody was taking any real action and even on a on a on a smaller level that um my my friends and family didn't weren't committed to it um or I should say my people that I was surrounded by didn't think it was important as, as I, I thought it was, but that has taken a complete 180. Mm -hmm. Environmentalism, environmental justice, um, learning about climate change is something that I know my friends and family do all the time. People are passionate about it. They recognize that it's happening, that climate change is real. I can't even, in law school, our our um, government representatives, many of them denied, even you know, the liberal representatives denied that climate change was was a thing. Can I just, sorry, I just want to ask, like, why do you think that is? Because you're absolutely right. And I remember when you were in law school, and I, on the one hand, I think it is, you know, it's the work of advocates and activists who are changing the conversation, right, and making it accessible to more people and showing the day-to-day -day impacts of it. I think it's just become more of an, an urgent, obvious issue that people are experiencing. We're seeing, you know, in San Francisco last year, the sky was orange because of wildfires, right? Like we're experiencing this, but I have to admit, like, 
I was one of those friends of yours. I mean, you never called me out on it. Maybe you're doing that now, but you know, I, the way that I, you <laughs> I, I had so much and always have just admiration for your dedication and passion to this issue. But I have to admit that, you know, back when you were in law school, when I, when we were both in law school, you were like my environment, you know, you're my best friend, but also like, you know, my invite, my friend who really cares about the environment and like my kind of like crunchy granola, your granola you know, friend. I'm sure, yeah, I was like, I'm sure this How is like- How many times do you think you called me your granola friend? Yeah, like my, you know, crunchy granola. I'm like, are these even PC things to say anymore? Or like, you know, like my tree hugger. And that's so in ridiculous that some someone would use the term like tree hugger as if, right, to suggest that that's like kind of a, somebody who's weird or really uh, kind of like, you know, nerdy about the environment when like we should all care about those things. And it's such a obvious, you know, I think especially now, again, because we see it, we're living through it, but like, and I, I know there's a lot of reasons for this, but what would you point to as sort of like the most effective, you know, uh, reason for why we have evolved in, in this conversation and in, you know, people's everyday engagement with this as a pressing issue? I think a lot of it, as you point out, is that people are experiencing it. People are experiencing the effects of climate change in real time, fires, floods, droughts, the risk that sea level is rising and will, you know, essentially swallow up Manhattan in a, in a lower Manhattan in a matter of years. That is affecting real estate values. It's affecting people's health. It's in our face right now. And in a way that, in my opinion, it's never been before. Mm -hmm. And even though it's frustrating that it takes that to, to affect change, I am so hopeful because people are talking about it and people, the fact that people are talking about it creates pressure. It creates pressure on our politicians to do something about it. And from, from what I've seen of the Biden-Harris administration's plan, they, they're taking action. They're, they're planning for a um, carbon neutral electricity grid by 2035. That is an aggressive commitment um, and will really change the way um, we operate in this country. And I, so I'm hopeful that, that, you know, all of this awareness that has come about will really create change and we can turn things around. Mm -hmm. I also want to give credit to, I think another reason why is it's the work of activists, often black activists, organizers, that's about the progressive movement, right? When we're talking about politics. And so this is really, you, it takes all of these things, right? But we have to give credit to, the people who, and, and folks like you, right, who've been doing this for decades, who have been talking about it forever and ever, and um, have been doing the work, right, and are organizing communities, are building political power in communities so that they can advocate for themselves and, uh, you know, align with other communities, right, to, to create more power so that you can, we can press leadership, we can press, you know, people who are making this, these decisions uh, to do the right thing and to hold them accountable. Um, so I'm really, I mean, that's something that inspires me and gives me hope is just seeing the the power of people and, and community organizing and uh, truly, you know, in, in terms of the progressive movement um, and, and just the enormous, I think, gains that we've made in pushing this agenda in, in just the last, you know, four to eight years. I think it's extraordinary and it, it gives me great hope to think about how much more we can do and if, if we organize more and if we're right, we're, we're, we're being heard. I think that's just to bring this back to the very beginning of the conversation, right? When people are represented, when people have political power and political voice so that they are heard, uh, their issues and experiences are addressed. And again, we have a long way to go, but uh, I, I, I'm really heartened and hopeful about the progress we've made so far. And it's up to, you know, folks who are watching, you know, Claire, this is your literal life's work, right? Like you were living and breathing this and Sorry, that was like such a terrible pun for our conversation about air quality. Sorry, I'm a nerd. But you know, like this is the, the point is that um, we have hope in a, in a new administration and new leadership, but it can't, you know, stop there, right? And it's it can't only be on them, right? It has to be on all of us to keep at this and to stay consistent and, and to keep going. And I hope that this progress, you know, gives people that motivation to keep going and see, you know, I, I think for some folks like you have been doing it for literally for decades or like finally, right? Like you're finally 
seeing what you've been hoping for forever and ever. And I, I really hope that that, you know, helps others um, who may not be in this every single day and day to day to see the power in, in doing your part, you know, and, and being involved and in, in being a part of the conversation at the very least. So I just want to end on saying thank you for everything that you do and your dedication and passion. Um, you've had an enormous impact on me personally as a friend and helping me to understand these issues better and to think about how I can, you know, be more engaged. And I just um, am so excited that I get to share you and through this event with, with everyone else. Um, and I'm so grateful um, for the opportunity to have this conversation. Thank you so much to the Little Market for inviting Mina and me have this discussion today and thank you to all the viewers um i hope you look more into environmental justice and learn more about it for yourself